This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Ruth chapter 2 this morning in your Bible. So read the first seven verses, and we'll stop there. Um, But we'll cover just this section of the the book of Ruth uh, as we continue the story here this morning. Ruth chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she came, or excuse me, and she went and came, and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light upon a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the land of Moab, of the land, excuse me, out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean after, uh, excuse me, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and hath continued, even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And as we look at this short section of scripture, and we consider Ruth and her involvement in this story, and Naomi and the other characters, Lord, I I pray that your word would be alive and quicken us here this morning. Help us to clear out the distractions of the week and, and just focus in on your word. And Lord, as this story both points forward to the Davidic line, Lord, there's nuggets for us to learn from in Ruth's actions and responses here. And I pray that you would work in our hearts here this morning. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Again, the book of Ruth is connecting us between the time period of Joshua and the judges and the time period of the kings. So as the story is moving forward, Ruth is in the middle or the context of that story. And just having a bad day technologically. All right, so Ruth sets itself up nicely as four acts. We've looked at act one, where all the characters were introduced, their problems, and and it's characterized by death and emptiness with Naomi's husband dying or two sons dying, which Ruth's husband was one of those sons. Ruth and Naomi have now left Moab, come back to Israel, uh, back to the land of promise, and there they are. We're now in chapter 2, where Ruth will meet Boaz in the field. Uh, Chapter 3, we'll have Ruth meeting Boaz on the threshing floor, and the the end of the story will provide a reversal of chapter 1, and what was barren and lost will be fulfilled in that there will be a son, and there's promise, there's hope moving forward. I've titled this morning's sermon, Seeking Grace, because in Act 2 here, verses 1 to 7, we find Ruth going out to find food in a foreign land. And she uses that phrase, she's looking to find someone who, um, who fav- has favor or grace on her and lets her glean in a foreign land. Here, um, this chapter, chapter 2 of Ruth, has a, a structure to it, and it's kind of neat how it works. She starts, we start with Ruth and Naomi having a discussion at home. And it's, they're home alone, and they're all starting over in a new life. They've come back to Bethlehem. They're starting over. They're starting afresh. 
the middle section and the bulk of the book will center on Ruth and Boaz, which we get partway into that, and I stopped it deliberately this week as a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, but we get into how will Boaz respond to this situation. And the chapter ends again with Ruth returning home and with Naomi and having a conversation about the events. So let's dive in here this morning, uh, right here with Ruth 2, verse 1. It says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth. We're noted here, makes the text makes note or clear that this is a kinsman of her husband, and it says again, of the family of Elimelech. The term here for kinsman is actually not the term goel. And, and goel is a term that's tightly tied to the person who would redeem. They were a close relative, the one to step up and take the property. Boaz is not that. In fact, throughout the text, we don't really know how Boaz is connected. We know that somehow he's part of the family. We know that somehow he's a different, distant relative of some sort. We just don't know. But by the end of the book, the term Goel will get applied to Boaz. Because he steps in to fulfill that role and responsibility of the Goel. Also here, it's important and significant that the connection here is not to Naomi, it's to her husband Elimelech. He, because of the connection to him, this bears responsibility on the family to raise up a child who can take the family name and the inheritance to move forward. Boaz here is called or referred to as a mighty man of wealth. Now it's interesting here, and this is... I decided to save some thoughts here for when we get to Ruth in our Bible reading for the year. There's, there's some stuff, nuggets we're going to dig out of this phrase, but we'll, we'll save that for now. He's a mighty man of wealth. That word mighty man is, is generally used, it's the word Hebrew term gabor. It's used of, of a man of valor, usually of warriors. So we have in Joshua 6, these mighty men of value and all, valor, valor, excuse me, and all through the Old Testament it's used of warriors. But is the text trying to portray for us Ruth and Boaz, Ruth, Boaz being a warrior? No. He's a mighty man of what? Wealth. He has economic power and status. So he has clout and weight. And it's interesting, I was talking actually with Mark Webb, and he brought up some thoughts that made me chase a few rabbit trails this week. Um, there's a family line that we have for Boaz. See, Boaz's father was Salmon, and Salmon's father was Nashon, and Nashon's father was Abinadab, and then that next little gap, you can skip there. There's a whole bunch of generations, but those are all part of the tribe of Judah. Now, Boaz's grandfather, Nashon, took part, when we read in Numbers and, and, and early on, he was, his father was part of the tribal leaders of the tribe of Judah. He was one of the ones who... Yes, the allotment of land to the tribes was done by Joshua when they conquered the land. But who did the sub-allotments? Well, these tribal leaders were the ones to, okay, here's our, here, this clan of the tribe and this clan gets this area. These men were the, men's, the ones who were able to do the sub-allotments, as it were, in the tribal territories. And it makes me wonder, we've been through this period of the judges, Boaz comes from a family line that was uh, described even as, as princes in the in First Chronicles. They're princes of the children of Judah. I find it odd that this royal line within Judah made sure they set themselves up well. Why did Naomi and Elimelech leave? They, famine and search of food. Boaz didn't leave. Boaz's family didn't need to leave. And it makes me just, I wouldn't push too hard on this. But being the leaders, Nosh and Boaz comes from a family who probably made sure they got a pretty good allotment. They set themselves up well. And I don't know if people would have looked at the leaders and said, okay, you guys have fattened your own pockets at our expense or not. But here Boaz comes from a royal line what are we going to expect out of this character? Will he be one to sacrifice his own integrity or his own good, his own benefit? Will he sacrifice that for others? Or will Boaz be one who is 
more about just accumulating his own wealth. Well, some of you know because you read the book of Ruth, but we will journey through this together. The name Boaz literally means mighty one or man of strength. Some think it's actually an abbreviated form of the phrase um, strength in strength of the Lord or in strength of Yahweh, something like that. But it's interesting, his, the name of this person is Boaz. What other names have been significant so far? Naomi's two sons, Malon and Kilion, um, Chilion uh, sickly or sicko, and Malon dying or deadness. So there's this contrast here between Boaz being a man of strength, and if possible here, uh, strength in the Lord, and Malon and Kilion sickly and dying. There's a contrast happening here between these individuals. We also then notice in verse 2, it says, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi. Now let's stop here and think about this. What was Ruth's ethnic line? It was Moabite. But who did she choose to align herself with? Naomi and the God of Israel. But the text is making very clear, making us remember, she's a Moabite. She's viewed as a Moabite. She's treated as a Moabite. She's, you could almost say, abused as a Moabite. Now, we'll get into the story and different things that happen. But even though Ruth has sacrificed everything to come with Naomi, nothing has changed. She's still an outsider in her mother-in-law's land. She comes to Naomi and she says, Let me now go to the, uh, to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I find grace. Now, some translations put this as like Ruth asking for permission to go. Not exactly what's happening. It's more she's making a statement, but in that statement, she's bring, coming to Naomi as a sense to get her blessing and approval on this action. She wants to be industrious and pull her weight to contribute to the household. She wants to, um, they need food. The barley harvest is just beginning. It's time to get out and get some food. Now, there's one rabbinic scholar who has an interesting thought on this. He thinks part of the reason Ruth wanted to go out is because, in one sense, think of all Naomi had lost. Think of the shame she was now bearing. For Ruth to go out and to glean, and for Ruth to take care of Naomi in this way, she would actually be shielding Naomi, not just from lack of food, but even shielding her from the social stigma of, hey, there's Naomi, the one who lost everything, and God is against her. And she came back a bitter woman. Now, whether that's true or not, I think it's an interesting point to consider that possibly here, Ruth is, is very carefully caring for her mother-in-law. Now, this whole idea of going out to glean is something that Old Testament law gave very specific rules for. For instance, in Leviticus 23, um, Leviticus 19 as well, which I skipped that one for today. Leviticus 23, verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make a clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleanings of the harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So, in essence here, they're not to get the corners of the field. But how much is a corner of a corner? I mean, how much is, you know, they're not supposed to go back over the field a second time. In Deuteronomy we read, um, When thou cuttest down thine harvest in the field, and hast forgotten a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go fetch it again, or uh, not go again to fetch it. It shall be for a stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in the work, in all the work of thy hands. When thou bear, uh, beatest the olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean after it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. What category is Ruth fitting under here? Out of stranger, fatherless, and widow? She's a widow and a stranger. And in one sense, she doesn't really have a father in the land, but, you know, she's a widow and a stranger. So the idea of these laws were, you're going to have a field. And you might 
determine how much of that corner you're leaving, but you leave some of the corner of the field. If you drop some stuff while you're, you're doing it, you just leave it. Someone else will come and pick it up. If you are getting all the sheaves in that you bound up and you forget one out there, you leave it. And then dealing with olive trees and stuff, you don't go over the branches two or three times. It was a way, it was, in a sense, it was God's welfare system. Israelites who were poor, strangers dwelling in the land, who didn't have property rights, they could come out to these fields and they could work a day's work. They could be in the fields, they could do what they could to get part of the harvest. They weren't allowed to take the cream of the crop. They weren't there just harvesting away. But anything that dropped, anything in the corners was left for them. And they'd go out and they'd glean. Now, it seems as if, throughout Scripture, and especially in this story, that the property owners still had a little bit of pull or sway into, they could kick you off their property. Okay, It's not exactly stated in the law, but the, Ruth has approached the foreman here, you know, basically asking for permission to glean in this field. So th there seems to be a little bit happening there, and I'm not 100% sure what all that means. But we read here, she says to her mother-in-law, let me go glean ears of corn in the field, in whose sight I shall find grace. Now the word for grace here is hesed, or, and it, it's the idea of favor. We, we like to talk about grace only at times in theological terms and how mercy is me not getting what I do deserve, but grace is getting what I don't deserve. And that's a good, simple definition. But there's more to it than just that with grace. Grace is not simply just getting what I don't deserve. Grace has to do with favor, which is why an old expression that we don't use much in English anymore is, I was graced with their presence. What does that mean? It means it was pleasant. It was enjoyable to be in someone's presence. Now think about that with, with God. God bestows his grace upon us, and often that grace is connected with a, a manifestation to some level of his presence in our lives. What is Ruth looking for? She's looking for a field, for a person who which she will find that favor. Someone who will let her glean in the field. Someone who will give her the opportunity to get food for her and her mother-in-law. She's looking for grace. And in a period of the judges where men often abused women and took advantage of them, Ruth is looking for a man who will show favor. And we're going to be a little surprised that, hey, there's a guy who actually does it. This also could be a very dangerous endeavor. She could be shooed off of the property. She can be abused in, in different ways. Um, and it's, it's almost a bit disarming or alarming, I guess I should say, because Naomi simply says to her, yeah, go. Now, Naomi would have known the risks associated. She would have known what was happening. She doesn't say any of that to Ruth. She just says, yeah, go. That's fine. Go, go do this. Um, Naomi we kind of wonder, why didn't she mention to Ruth about Boaz? We know later in the text, when Ruth comes to her and tells her that I went to the field of Boaz, Naomi gets all excited. Hey, he's one of our near relatives. But she doesn't mention that here. What is going on with Naomi? It's, it's a bit surprising. Um, she, Naomi doesn't warn Ruth about the possible dangers she could encounter uh, or the harm. And it's almost as if... Naomi is only marginally paying attention to Ruth and her well-being. Maybe it's because Naomi herself is still overwhelmed by her own grief and sorrow. As we ended chapter 1, she's wanted everybody to call her bitter. But she has mixed feelings, I think, about Ruth's role in her life. She has come back from Moab. She now has a Moabite attached to her. There's stigma involved here. And I don't think... She's valuing here God's role that Ruth is playing in her life. We go into verse 3 here. It says, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap, or it just so happened, it was just sheer luck that she was to light upon a field belonging unto Boaz, 
who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, this is an interesting phrase as well. In fact, you don't find this idea of hap or luck much in Scripture. And I think the writer of Ruth here is giving us a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge, pay attention to this here. We have some of these hap things in the stories with the Philistines, where they, they're determining the will of the gods, and they're like, well, if this, we'll see if this is just a happening or if this is actually something God's doing. And they're, they're testing things. But the authors of Scripture know there is no such thing as sheer coincidence. There is no such thing as just luck. There is a God who's seated on the throne who rules in everything. But this text gives us she just happens to go to the field of Boaz. I think the author's winking at us going, yeah, we know this is her just acting on her own. We know she's, I mean, she has Naomi's support. We know that she is um, trying to be industrious, but she doesn't know the lay of the land. You ever been in a foreign place? You don't know the rules. You don't know what to do. It's an awkward situation. Or you get to another um, area of, of land, and you don't know who owns what and how they respond to things, and, and you, you want to be careful. Ruth is entered into a world that is foreign to her. She doesn't understand the people. She doesn't understand the full significance of what she's doing. But God had led her there. Now the text winks at us and says, it just happened this, this, this way. But Ruth was looking for a gracious man, and what she finds in Boaz will be a gracious man from the right clan. And we see behind this the hidden hand of God at work through this story. Verse 4 to 5 goes on, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, You know, Boaz just happened to come at this point, you know, just God's timing just kind of happens to be the right time. But how does he greet his workers? He says, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. This is completely counter to what you hear in most construction sites. Is it not? I mean, this is the culture and environment, the subculture, as it were, that Boaz has created with his workers and workmen. Now, Ruth is in the period of what? Judges. Does this sound like the book of Judges? This does not sound like, you know, the, the, the cursing and the conflict back and forth and the infighting and the turmoil. And this is very counter to that, which gives us some hope that within Israel, in the time of the judges, there were pockets of people like Boaz doing the right thing. But remember, this is Ruth's first exposure to Boaz. He's apparently a godly man, unlike these, the, the period of the judges. And... He, he then asks, he, you know, he's greeted his men. They replied with a blessing to him and the Lord. And verse 5, he goes on to say, whose damsel is this? Now, it's also interesting. The word he uses for damsel is not a word that would link her as a stranger or foreigner. It's not a degrading term. It's, it's more of one of endearment, not necessarily love and affection. But he wants to know, what are your connections? Who's taking care of her? Who does she belong in the Old Testament, it, for a woman not to be connected to some man or individual was a major problem, and it left her vulnerable. Um, and so he's wanting to know, what's the family connection? How's this work? Um, he asks who she belongs, and this is going to connect her economically and socially uh, to the society. This is what's interesting. He asks the question. Now, a character that I don't know I've heard much preached on in the book of Ruth is this supervisor. Because his response is very interesting. In verse 6 we read, And the servant, or supervisor, the foreman, that was set over the reapers, answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Okay, pause. What did he make sure Boaz knew about her? He made sure. One of the first things he, we know about is he's... This gentleman, or this, this young lady, is from Moab. Now, I'm going to repeat here some of what we've talked about before. Why was this a big deal? Well, Moab, in the Israelites' mind, your nation, the origin of your nation, was part of your stigma. So, the origin of the nation of Moab comes from Lot and his two daughters in a cave. And the term for Amorites is, is a play on words that means, of my father. And the term Moab comes from two words as well. Um, 
meaning of my father. It's just a different way of doing it. So it's almost as if you would get a snicker from an Israelite, like, yeah, you remember the Moabites. They're the ones that started from an incestuous relationship in a cave. They're, it's degrading. Moab refused to allow Israel passage in Numbers 22, and Balaam and Balak worked together to try to curse Israel. At Baal Peor, in Numbers 5, the Moabite women had seduced Israelites into all sorts of immorality and idolatry. And in Deuteronomy 23, we read that an Ammonite and a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. What exactly that means, we're not sure. Does that mean they can't enter into the tabernacle? Does that mean they can't come into the land of Israel? Um, there's some discussion there. But as a whole, Israel looks down on the Moabites. But here's a Moabite who's chosen to follow the Lord. Who's chosen Yahweh over Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. Here's a Moabite who's shown faithful, loyal love to Naomi. And so all of this is, is packed behind this foreman's answer in that there's disdain for Moabites, and he makes sure Boaz knows it. He makes sure he knows, her, uh, he knows where she's from. Verse 7 goes on. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. This is where it seems as if there has to be some permission here to be in the land. But then we have a phrase, so she came and continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now, this last part, this she tarried a little in the house, I, I, it's just really interesting because it's very clear for us in English. Um, so let me read that phrase again. And hath continued from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now, the King James doesn't make it as clear as other translations smooth it out to be. Some say, except she spent a little time in the house. Um, I'll, I'll read a few descriptions of this. Uh, one writer puts it this way. Let the reader of the Bible note well, however, that a hundred conjectures about a badly disrupted text are more likely to go wrong than any one of them absolutely right. This is the hardest verse to translate in the entire book of Ruth. This verse almost is garbled in its Hebrew. Now, it's not that the words are mis hard to understand. It's not that, but the way they're put together, it's just not clear what's happening. Some have translated it as she was sitting a little while in the house. Others have translated it as, except for a short rest, you know, she was in the house, which that translation follows what the Septuagint translators did. They tran the Septuagint, when they translated from Hebrew to Greek, they translated as she did not stop in the field even for a little while. So they're taking that idea. But we don't really know what's happening. And as I was reading this, you know, the Hebrew is above my level. I haven't taken Hebrew. But I really like what one person noted. He's like, we really don't know, and a good commentator will, will tell you that, but he said, the shape of the text reflects the emotional state of the speaker. Who's speaking? This foreman. He's uncomfortable. What is he uncomfortable with? It could be he's uncomfortable with Ruth as a Moabitess. It could be he's not sure how Boaz is going to respond to this. Is he going to be in trouble because he let a Moabite into Boaz's field? Or is he going to be in trouble because he maybe didn't let her have as much go at the field as not? We, he, do, he is answering to Boaz. We don't fully know what's happening here. But as uh, one writer puts it, it seems that the narrator has intentionally preserved the convoluted reading to aid in the characterizing of the supervisor. Not only has the young man painted Ruth with negative brush strokes, reminding us that she's a Moabite, but his stammering style at this point also conveys his own insecurities and nervousnesses before his boss, who may see through his exaggeration, if not fabricated, fabrication of Ruth's incident. We don't know for sure what this means. It doesn't mean we can't understand our Bible. That's not the point. I really resonate with this idea that the writer of scripture is giving us halting text to convey the halting struggle of this supervisor. And we, we do this in our literature today. You know, there's something called good grammar, right, and, and, and speech. But sometimes people will break the rules of that deliberately 
for instance, in, in maybe a movie or a book, you'll have halting sentences. And what does that convey to you? Well, the person may be saying something, but you recognize in that it, it's conveying more than the words. It's conveying that struggle they're having. They may pause. They sometimes, um, if a word, want, if, if a book wants to give you a southern uh, element to it, it'll respell a word to an incorrect spelling, so that you think, oh, okay, this is kind of the word with a southern drawl or or whatever. Okay, that may be what's happening here in the text, and the Bible is just conveying this to us. But then again, how much would it take for Ruth to turn back? This is where I want to go with this this morning, and I just kind of want to park here. What does it take for you to turn back? Ruth has left her homeland. Her husband is dead. Her father-in-law is dead. But Ruth was faithful. When Naomi has thrown her under the bus on return, as if there is nothing good come out of Moab, and my life is all bitter, everything's horrible now, God is against me, and she completely ignored Ruth, Ruth stayed faithful. When there's an opportunity to go out and work and to, to get some food to provide for her and Naomi, what does she do? She's not going into a field she grew up in as a kid. She's not going to a place where she knows people and she knows the system. She knows how this works. She's a foreigner, a stranger in the land. She just happens to end up in Boaz's field. And I'm not so sure this foreman was the kindest to her. There is a level of kindness he does, because he allows her to glean in the field, it seems. But what will Boaz's response be? Okay, so she's got permission from the foreman, but how will the head boss respond? And, and yet, even when that foreman may have looked down on her, she persists and she did what she could. She's left her homes. She's left her gods. She stayed faithful to the Lord through turmoil. What about you and me? What does it take to stop us? What does it take for you to throw in, your t in the towel and say, I quit. This is done. This is too much. At what point do you say, you know, I started following the Lord. I tried to do this. I made this commitment, but this is just too much. And you walk away. For some of us, it may not be a walking away from the faith, but maybe we walk away from a decision or a commitment we made to the Lord. Because it just gets too hard. Ruth has shown herself to be industrious and faithful in a surprising way. We wouldn't expect this out of a Moabite. But God has woven it together. Now, we see the big picture of the story as well. We know this is pointing towards and moving forward toward David and moving towards his line. And Messiah would come. But Ruth doesn't know any of that. Ruth is living with the day-to-day -day experiences of having an empty belly, of being hungry, of working in the hot sun, and just hoping to find grace and favor in someone's eyes. It wasn't a free handout, but she's hoping for grace and favor. May you or I be people who look for grace and favor, first of all, in our God but also in those around us. We need favor, and we need to show grace and favor. Now, I'm going to leave it as a cliffhanger. How will Boaz respond? I know you can all cheat, and you can read ahead. That's fine, and I encourage that. But how will Boaz respond when he hears the word of this Moabite working in his field? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And Lord, as Ruth here was seeking for a person, one in which she would find favor so that she could glean in the field. Father, we need favor in our lives. Sometimes it's from other people. But most of all, Father, we need your favor on our lives. We need your face shining upon us. Lord, this morning, as we think of how committed Ruth has shown herself to be, so far in the text, we've not even seen or heard what her thoughts are, but we've seen her actions. We've seen her commitment. Father, make us a people committed to you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as Laquita begins to play a hymn of invitation, let me ask you to do business of God. Maybe there's a commitment you've made to God. Maybe it's 
something that you've backed out on. And it's time to renew it. How much is too much? I trust the Lord has done a work in your heart and encouraged you to stay the course, just as Ruth. Stick with it. God is on the throne. He's working all things. And what right now for her is just happens to be God's hidden hand is working all things together for good to them who love God. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. We thank you for the example of Ruth, an outsider, a Moabitist, one looked down upon and disdained by her neighbors. And yet, Father, she remained faithful to you. She remained industrious to care for Naomi. May you stir up that type of faith and response in our heart and lives as well. May we be a people faithful through thick and thin. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.